Thank you all for uh, braving the weather to make it here today. Uh, we hope to have a very interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Scarlett Aldebot Green. Um, I'm a senior policy analyst in our asset building program. Uh, I work on a global development project um, called Youth Save. Uh, as you can see, I'm losing, sort of getting back my voice. So actually, I'll let these folks talk a lot more. So I'll be moderating today's event, and then I'll introduce uh, everyone, and we'll get started. So in the far end, we have uh, Kate. McGowan. Um, she's the Digital Finance Lead and Senior Policy Advisor for USAID um, Administrator. At USAID, uh, she has helped conceptualize and implement the agency's approach to accelerating the growth of inclusive electronic and related digital financial services. Radha Reshkotia is the Senior Director for Economic Programs at um, IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Uh, in this role, she sets the vision for IRC's global strategy for economic programming and supervises a team of technical experts who support IRC's global economic programming. Uh, she'll be talking today uh, about a publication um, and, and on some more uh, issues as well uh, called Emerging Emergency Economies, the Impact of Cash Assistance in Lebanon, um, which I hope you all had the opportunity to pick up outside. If not, I think we still have some copies. Um, and there's an, a link to it, which you obviously can't click, but you can see the URL um, on your bio sheet. Um, Sarah Bailey is an independent consultant and a research associate at the Overseas Development Institute in London, uh, where she was a full-time researcher for the Humanitarian Policy Group for five years. And Michael Fay is the co-founder and CEO of Segovia Technology, uh, as well as the co-founder and executive chairman of Give Directly. Um, in these various roles, Michael has focused and focuses on building an operational model and its associated technology for implementing cash transfer programs as effectively as possible. So Kay, we'll start us off. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I know the weather is terrible, so I'm glad uh, that there are some brave souls uh, that were willing to come out. Um, I do run the digital finance team at USAID, which is part of USAID's newly launched Global Development Lab which is really helping um, equip the rest of the agency to better incorporate science, technology, innovative business model, and partnerships to try to accelerate development outcomes across uh, the agency's portfolio. You know, USAID is uh, the largest bilateral donor in the world, and the vast majority of our budget actually goes into agriculture and health programs. Uh, quite a bit as well goes into humanitarian response. And one of the, one of the opportunities um, that's really fraught with lots of challenges, as you'll hear about today, is how to take what we see now as these, this emerging economic infrastructure uh, that's been made possible, really, most fundamentally, by the, uh, by the spread of mobile technology coupled with new approaches to um, using agents to get banking services outside of brick and mortar physical uh, branches, and the rise of sort of financial inclusion as, as important global development um, imperatives. And so what we're trying to figure out right now at USAID is how can we use the programming and the relationships that we have um, with governments and partners overseas for general development purposes, how can we use that to help accelerate the growth of, uh, of these digital transaction platforms, which you know, are commonly known as mobile money, but also have you know, much greater capability than just basic money transfer services over mobile phones. We're now seeing um, you know, mobile wallets where basic transaction accounts where people can store money um, as well as send and receive money, pay bills. But then there's a whole host of products that once people are included in the financial system in this very basic way, that they become, um, they become sort of prime consumers of or potential consumers of. And the really important um, risk mitigation tools uh, such as access to credit, insurance, savings products. So what we're really wrestling with is how can we marry these two agendas of using um, the money that we spend on trying to deliver assistance through either agriculture programs or health programs, or in this case what we're talking about today is humanitarian programs, 
how can we not only improve the delivery of those um, of that assistance by making it faster, um, more efficient, and in the case of cash, is it starting to um, more increasingly replace commodities as, uh, as what we give to people, more effective and more, um, you know, more uh, impactful in terms of the local economy. How can we use those programs and think about pushing them through channels that actually help build lasting economic infrastructure in these countries? And there are a lot of uh, issues associated with that, but I think the opportunity both to really accelerate financial inclusion, but also improve the transparency and effectiveness of aid delivery and then I think finally and most importantly, the opportunity to help build this market infrastructure that can really redefine broad-based economic growth in, in poor countries, I think is so compelling that it's exciting to have the opportunity to speak with everyone here today and figure out together how we're gonna take some of those, those challenges on. Great. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great, uh, great to be here. Um, I'm here really to talk about two things. So one is to share with you some of the findings from the um, research that we conducted on the Lebanon Winter Cash Assistance Program last year. Um, but then secondly, to um, build off that and um, address some of the issues that Kay has raised in terms of um, how we use that evidence um, and the experience that it uh, that it also culminated <coughs> in from the field, um, and and take that into um, into new directions uh, going forward. So just in terms of the research, then I'll give you a quick overview, and hopefully you'll have a chance to look at the report in more detail. So this was um, a, a piece of research that was conducted on the winter cash assistance program that UNHCR was implementing um, through implementing partners and operational partners on the ground in Lebanon um, between, um, between December and March 2013 to 14. Um, the program was targeting 90,000 households, so it was a relatively sizable program. Um, and what we thought would be um, a really interesting thing to do would be to really try and evaluate what the impact of that program is, both on the households, but then also looking more broadly at the market and the economy within which the Syrian refugees are living. Um, the, it, was also, uh, it was also an interesting piece of research because it was not um, a program that IRC was implementing. We are an implementing agency. That's our main bread and butter work. But for us, this, um, this really came as an opportunity to um, conduct a rigorous evaluation and contribute to a, an existing evidence base. Um, but really build that out with a focus on refugee assistance and, and the role of cash within that. Um, so we jumped at the chance and were able to work with our research partners, um, Professor Christian Le uh, Lehman and uh, Daniel Masterson from the Universities of Brasilia and, and Yale, respectively, um, to design a research uh, methodology that was based off the program design itself. So. Um, lucky for us, we were um, able to find that you know the program was implemented based off um, demographic <laughs> and geographic criteria. So it was people's vulnerability criteria, but then also coupled with um, the altitude at which they were living. So households that were living above 500 meters in particularly cold areas um, were provided cash assistance, whereas those living below 500 meters were not. So we, were found, we found a very clear and easy to use um, uh, differentiator point there. So we could compare households that lived just above with those households just below, so that we could really get a strong causal attribution from the cash itself. Um, so what were we able to find from that? So I, I think there's a few things to point out there. I think um, one, and this, uh, I think there's a few points to point, uh, to highlight in terms of what it doesn't tell us. So one is that it, it was not a study comparing cash assistance to in-kind support. Um, all of those households living above and below 500 meters were, had, um, uh, were provided food vouchers, um, electronic vouchers for, for food assistance, um, but only those living above were, were, uh, were provided with cash assistance. And so that's the piece that's the effect of the cash that we were really interested in, in understanding. 
Um, the second thing it doesn't do is provide us a statement that cash works in all settings for all refugees everywhere. Um, as much as that would have been great. Um, it tells us about you know, those populations living just above and below that, that threshold. And we would want to take great caution in trying to extrapolate from there and really build on the number of studies that have come before and, and I'm sure will come after um, to contextualize that. Um, and then the last thing I think that we need to be cautious with is, is also just the, um, the fact that we would want, we want to continue a full investigation of the effects of cash. So, things like gender implications um, or protection issues um, that, that were highlighted through the findings, but that we would want to really dig in, uh, dig a lot deeper into to understand fully. So what did it tell us then? Um, so there were a few things that it pointed to in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the effects. So one was um, you know, really positive findings around what households were spending it on. The intention was that the cash would be used for uh, winter assistance, so for winter warmth materials. Um, what the research found was that um, people were spending money on basic needs, so food, water, um, warmth materials as well. Um, but what it also found was that people weren't necessarily spending it entirely on, uh, um, on warm supplies or even in the majority case on warm, warm materials. Um, about ten dollars um, was spent. Ten dollars of the hundred dollars per month was spent on winter warmth materials, um, and the vast majority was still spent on food and water. Um, and this was in the context of um, you know all households also receiving food assistance. Um, putting in context, um, you know how that could be explained. There's a couple things that should be considered. So one is just the um, the fact that households were also largely in debt. So um, across the board, every household was found to be at least $500 in debt per month um, and was carrying that debt burden. Um, and so the extent to which there was need um, in terms of just covering basic needs, that was huge. Um, a second thing was just really looking at the context in Lebanon and it wasn't as cold a winter as people were expecting. So that could potentially explain some of this. Um, other findings were all positive too. There were reduced negative coping mechanisms, you know, control uh, households were sending their kids out to work more than people who, households that had received cash assistance. Households that had re received cash assistance were able to spend more on education, spend more on, um, uh, on, on food and, and good portion sizes for their families. Um, an important finding for us was also that out of the households um, who were interviewed, 80% of those um, said that they preferred cash. Even when they were receiving cash and in kind, 80% said, yes, we would prefer cash. Um, this might not seem surprising to you or I. I think I would prefer cash in most, most <laughs> instances too. Um, but I think in terms of the ongoing discussions of, of what we use, the fact that people were speaking for themselves and, and um, stating their own preferences um, in, such a, in such a strong way was, was meaningful. Um, beyond the household level impacts, there were also positive impacts on them locally. So in terms of market effects, there were no, um, no sustained inflationary impacts. There was also a, a calculated multiplier effect of $2.13 on every dollar that was dispersed. Um, and uh, in terms of one of the important findings um, that, that we were interested in and the government of Lebanon was interested as, in as well was um, the issue of social tension. So um, the, there was a perception that providing cash to um, Syrian, Syrian refugees would, uh, would increase tensions with local Lebanese populations, but that wasn't found to be the case and actually, in, uh, actually relationships improved. So what are we doing with this? Um, so this, the findings are, are positive. We were excited to see, um, we were excited to learn um, the positive effects of this large scale program. Um, but I think for IRC, and this is where I will deviate from what the research is telling us to what IRC is doing with this. Um, I think there are a few things, um, three main points. So one is that we're really taking on board this notion that people preferred cash. The idea that people wanted to be able to um, have the have access to cash and also then make uh, choices about what it was used for 
And the choices were all those kinds of choices that we would want to see in terms of humanitarian outcomes. So meeting basic needs, food, water, um, shelter, these were all things that, that, um, that align well with what we are interested in. Um, alongside this, I think the, there is, um, we, we would like to take that to say that you know, cash will and should be our default position where, where feasible, where markets, where markets allow for it and security um, provides the opportunity. Um, but taking that one step further to say that within that, there, there is also an emphasis for us on digital payments. Um, there's a huge interest. Um, there's a huge interest and opportunity in terms of um, the efficiencies that, that that would provide, and that's something that we will continue to invest in. So to do that, there are two things that we would focus on, and one is around um, preparedness and in, in our emergency work, and then the second is around response. So in on the preparedness side, um, we are looking at um, continuing to. Uh, I think one thing that we're looking at is really trying to unpack um, some of the operational aspects of what it means to deliver cash in, in emergencies. So despite the findings that you know, cash works, one thing that we're really dissatisfied with is how long it takes, how expensive it remains, um, and how um, potentially unsatisfactory it is for the recipients in terms of not only the, the cost that it impl implies for them, but the, the, the waiting times that it, it, um, it involves. Um, so things that we will focus on are pre-positioning and, and preparing um, for cash deployments ahead of, of crises. Um, and then really, really holding a, a, a high bar around the metrics that are used for, um, for measuring responses um, and response times following a crisis. So the last, uh, the last thing that I will talk about, um, and, then, and then I'll hand over to Sarah, is just the fact that in doing this, and this is why these kinds of conversations are very important to us, is that we don't want to do this alone. Is that um, I think one of the things that we've seen both through the Lebanon um, case study, um, but also through our global operations, is that for an NGO um, to go out and develop preparedness maps in every country in which it's operational, if we're asking every INGO to go and do that, um, you know, we, 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 may as well, uh, we may as well give up now. Um, what we are interested in doing is making sure that we're able to work with others, so with other INGOs, with, um, with, government, with government partners, um, with the private sector, to look at both how we can incentivize different kinds of um, different kinds of um, collaborations, so st stemming this, bridging this humanitarian development divide, but then also trying to look at um, and face head on what the risks would be in doing that. Um, digital payments, from our perspective, um, are cash is not new. Um, but the way that we approach cash could be quite disruptive. And it may mean that some of us are, some of the actors traditionally involved in, in its delivery may no longer have a purpose within that. And that's a conversation that we're keen to sort of drive forward and, and have openly and with, um, with courage <laughs> so, that, uh, so that we can look at you know, the strongest humanitarian outcomes. Great, um, and so many interesting points to build upon, and, and so useful to see um, some of this rigorous research coming out. Because in a sense, uh, we've shifted the debate on cash transfer programming. It used to be, well, can, can we do it? And the answer is yes. It's been yes for quite some time. I mean, if you look at pilots being done in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, but we're continuing to develop around, well, how should we do it? What does it mean? And now, just picking up on that last point, it's, it's that it also has some fundamental implications for how aid is delivered and who delivers it. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit about, um, I come from a humanitarian background. I'm a humanitarian researcher. I was also an aid worker, and I've been working on cash uh, in different ways uh, since 2006. And so I'm going to talk about some of, the, you know, some of the realities about the humanitarian settings and taking this forward in the humanitarian system. Uh, because there's uh, a lot of momentum for cash. It still remains an extremely small portion of humanitarian aid compared to in-kind uh, for various reasons. Um, 
And there's also um, some very you know, legitimate focus on financial inclusion and digital payment systems. Uh, but it comes from to humanitarian settings. We also need, we need to keep in mind some of the challenges and some of the weaknesses in, in taking uh, some of these payment solutions forward. And so one of the first points <coughs> is, um, you know, vouchers were just mentioned there uh, in passing uh, electronic vouchers being used in Lebanon. And it's something we need to just keep an eye on. Uh, for now, I think, whereas we actually saw a lot more cash versus in kind uh, around, you know, when cash was first sort of picking up speed, now we're seeing a lot more cash versus vouchers. Um, we're seeing more vouchers now than we certainly did when, when cash programming was, was um, you know, being piloted a bit more uh, several years ago. And why is that? Well, one is the Syrian response. Um, there are some reasons why vouchers are being chosen related to, to government, so I'm not saying that they shouldn't be used at all. Um, but it's also that aid agencies are looking for ways to control this approach, and that has, a, that has implications for the systems that they're going to be using to deliver it. Uh, the, the description for this meeting uh, said, well, World Food Program's delivering 30% of its assistance in cash now. Technically, that's not actually correct. Mm -hmm. It's 30% in cash and vouchers. Uh, and as we lump those together, mm -hmm. we're actually talking about two about very, you. very different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also involved in a, in a study for DFID for the UK government on the value for money of cash transfers. Um, and I think that's because, again, as we're taking evidence forward, we're looking for some of the more specific questions, not just will it work, but what does it mean for cost effectiveness? Um, what does it mean for impact? Uh, and I'm not going to get too much into those findings because it really is more of a cash versus vouchers versus in-kind uh, discussion. Um, spoiler alert, though, it depends. It depends mm -hmm. on the context. Mm -hmm. It depends a lot on how you design a program. It's not just what you give or what you do. It is how you do it. Um, and I don't think people are ever really satisfied of the answer. It depends. But good news, we are looking at the factors that it depends on. So we moved past that quite a bit. <coughs> but one of our case studies was, um, was Lebanon. And what I think is interesting there is, um, I mean, electronic systems are not necessarily um, more expensive or less expensive than cash. It depends on how they're being done. Um, so WFP gave us numbers, um, and please don't tweet this or anything, um, that said that you know their, using their system for cash was more expensive than using their system for vouchers. Uh, that's because it was down to a loading fee uh, related to using the card. Uh, but what we have to look at, well, is does that mean that every system's that way, or does it have to do with a particular system? Getting cost data is really, really tricky. And you think, but well, we all have budgets, and we know, you know, banks will tell you how much the transfer fees are. Um, but agencies put their costs in different ways. They're going through different channels. There's different in intermediaries, and there's different ways of negotiating fees. Um, so another agency has been looking at a slightly different fee structure um, for that system. So, so it's not necessarily. Um, that electronic systems or digital systems are less expensive. Um, if you look at studies from Lebanon and a few others that exist for humanitarians who operate doing very short-term programs, it can be a large investment in the beginning. Uh, a lot of the savings that we've seen in a couple of the studies coming out is that it becomes cheaper over time. Um, but if you're doing a short-term program, well, then what does that mean? So aid agencies, <coughs> you know, in the humanitarian setting, they do prioritize uh, the systems that are going to be the least costly, that are going to reach the most people. And that, uh, you know, they're not necessarily looking at issues around, well, what does this mean for the longer term? Because that's simply not, you know, their priority. Uh, the, the, the purpose is really to reach people quickly. And that's not to, to, to criticize them or to criticize the system that I work for. Uh, it's because there's trade-offs. Uh, there's trade-offs between different objectives. Um, my case study was in Philippines. You had um, different agencies uh, using uh, mainly remittance. I mean, it was mainly remittance systems that were remittance systems, systems <laughs> that were used to deliver um, cash. One agency uh, chose to use mobile money. And why was it one? Well, because they were working more on recovery related. They had multiple transfers. They really had an objective of linking people to systems. And the other eight agencies, of which there were at least 25, uh, had priorities on an immediate disaster response. Remittance system is extremely well developed. It was a natural choice for going in and using the systems. Um, so, you know, what does that mean if we're talking about these payment systems for humanitarians? It usually means that they're going to use a system that's in place, that's most convenient, that's going to have the most access, and they're going to reach people the quickest. Um, so digital payment systems can be, you know, can be a game changer when they're there. But I would say humanitarians are not the people that you look for to be necessarily expanding them. 
um, because they're also not very reliable. Um, if you look right now, we've got um, we've got annual funding cycles. Um, we've got uh, unfortunately, World Food, Food Program has announced that they're going to be suspending a lot of their assistance if they're not reaching, uh, if they don't get the funding that they need. And so it's not necessarily um, when you're looking at using uh, humanitarian aid as a vehicle, you have to keep in mind all these dynamics and all the weaknesses within the system itself. And getting back to our Lebanon case study, well, one of the value for money headlines wasn't about the cost of different systems. It was about, well, we've got um, both cash and vouchers being used. Uh, we have ATM cards, paper vouchers, electronic vouchers being used. We have cash and vouchers being used for 14 different objectives, from winterization to health to food um, to education to even accessing legal assistance. And, you know, and it's being done by 30 different aid agencies. So if you think that the, when you step back and think about using cash, that's, that it can be done to, to achieve any, any objective, and it's, it's the flexibility that's the advantage. So what does it mean when we have this compartmentalization within it? And what does that mean for the systems that people are being used and being able to take those forward in, in ways that might be more strategic? Um, so it's not necessarily about the system they use. It's about the reasons why aid agencies are often divided and compartmentalized. And we have to just keep in mind those, those issues when we're moving forward. Um, so I would just close by saying, don't underestimate the tendencies for aid agencies to try to incorporate solutions on their own terms. Um, cash can cross all of the things that divide the humanitarian system. It can cross the clusters, it can cross silos, it can even cross mandates. However, what's happening with cash is that people have the tendency to incorporate it in, I will now do cash for food, I will now do cash for children, and I will now do cash for winterization, when households do not divide their lives mm. according to objectives and according to sectors. And oddly, this is seen as a challenge, but it's really a Trojan horse, a much needed Trojan horse for a lot of the weaknesses within the humanitarian system. Um, but we need to keep those weaknesses in mind and not gloss over them when we're looking at ways that we might be able to identify opportunities uh, for using cash-based assistance to achieve longer-term objectives related to um, you know, access to financial systems. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. I think uh, you've all made my life very easy by saying things I agree with. So <laughs> I'll try to add something uh, and go from there. I'm actually going pick to up, pick up on something both of you mentioned. I think the Lebanon program was cash for winterization. Mm -hmm. And then people spent it on <laughs> food. And the way the report and it, it gets talked about is people didn't use it for winterization. And that's sort of the point that we went in thinking that that's what folks needed. And for reasons some potentially we could have known and some we couldn't, like it wasn't a very cold winter. That's not what people needed. And that's kind of the value of cash. And to Sarah's point, I think a lot of the siloing of cash programs, that gets lost in. Um, at Give Directly, we've been asked to, can you do a program showing that cash is better for X child nutrition? Um, and we've really pushed back against that because I think when you reduce cash to a single metric, you actually defeat the point of cash. Um, I'll talk about two things, the what and the how. I think when we started Give Directly, I, I, my background was research initially before I got into implementation more. Uh, when we started Give Directly and started conceiving it in the late 2000s um, and went around talking to people, the, the response was very consistently, you're crazy. Um, we were asked whether we were smoking crack <laughs> um, we then got asked whether the recipients were smoking crack, and then there was a whole discussion around who was smoking the crack. <laughs> but that was the conversation. And World Food Program, vouchers, cash, it, it was basically nothing at the time. Um, and it was strange because coming from an academic background, it existed. Cash was nothing new. Give Directly was not the first group to do cash. Governments had been doing it for a decade at that point. Um, we were the first and only nonprofit exclusively dedicated to it, but we certainly weren't the first to introduce it. But the story was, you're crazy. I think here we are, what, five, five years later, and the rhetoric has completely changed. I think cash is starting to be seen as the benchmark, and you'll hear things like, well, the cash debate is over, or it's almost over. And I would like to agree with that, but just also be conscious of the fact that due to some of these political challenges, that in many cases, policy has lagged uh, kind of where the debate in this room has been. I think we have some of the heroes of those policy fights here. I think USAID 
has changed their policy in a humanitarian context, uh, largely thanks to Kay and others, um, where cash has become a bit of a benchmark um, in parts of USAID, um, similarly for the IRC. So it's starting to change, but it hasn't quite gone as far as a lot of us would like. So it, it's not over yet. That leads us to the second part of the question, which is not the what do we do, but how do we do it? And I think that debate is just starting, and I think this dialogue is about that debate, which is great, we're doing cash, how do we do it? And I think we have a long ways to go there. I'll start with some very high level numbers and then just walk through some of the specific challenges that we and other folks face. Um, the World Economic Forum released a report uh, looking at the overall cash transfer market. And the numbers were somewhere at 400 billion to 500 billion of government to individual cash transfers. But I thought what was most striking about that report was not the headline number, but the number that about 40 billion of that is leaked and disappears um, either through pure leakage or operational cost each year. Is it 40 billion? 40 billion is about twice the international giving that kind of US philanthropists give each year. So what that tells us, if we can solve the how we do it problem, it would almost be the same as doubling an entire sector of philanthropy or total US giving. So it's pretty remarkable, and I hope, and I hope this is the beginning of a conversation where we start spending more time on the how we do it. Um, and, this, and you can talk about cash. I mean, we've spent a bunch of time working in India. Um, when you look at the programs and you look at the leakage and operational cost, you're talking numbers between 50 and 75% of the actual program cost. Um, so can we get that down to 5, 10, 20% even? Um, so that's kind of the first part. And then we say, well, what, what is the problem? Why, why is it um, so expensive? And I, I won't go into too much details, but if you just think of the simplest program, and I'll use a voucher program, which speaks a bit to the power of moving towards mobile money and systematic solutions. Um, in the simplest form of a voucher program or a coupon program, you literally have someone going door to door giving out coupons to people. Or first they identify people and maybe collect some information with pen and paper. That comes back to an office. Someone may enter it into Excel um, if you're lucky. There's a decision about whom to give to, and you go back out and distribute it. It may be distributed in vouchers. It may be given to the post office to distribute to the post office. Now you start to think, well, wait a second. Well, how do you know the people we think are getting are getting? It's a good question. Well, those vouchers then go, they're brought to the local merchant. And I have a bit of experience in India with this. Well, you give a voucher for a dollar, and the merchant takes out 50 cents and says, here you go. You complain. What are you going to, so what's the problem? You're getting 50 cents. So there's another issue. Um, and in many cases, the vouchers can actually be transferable before you start to get towards mobile money and systems. So now you've built a system which is not auditable. So you've built a system for giving out lots of money, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's not auditable. You say, okay, well, what's another system that I can think of that moves hundreds of billions? Remittances, credit cards. But those systems are subject to very strict regulations around knowing your customer and the way those payment systems can operate. You need to know who you're sending to. Western Union spends a lot of money on compliance to make sure they know with certainty who's getting that, that they're not on a terrorist list, um, and so on. And right now, those standards have not been applied to a rapidly growing sector, um, which is concerning, because you do want to know who's getting the money. And you do want to know it's getting there without the leakage and extreme costs that a lot of these programs have. The next question may be, well, don't we know how to do this? Yes, with a lot of caveats. And the way I think about this is think about sending your Christmas gift to your family. How do you know it got there? Well, you probably get a UPS tracking code. You probably go on the UPS website and you see that it got picked up at the packing station two hours ago. So you f feel pretty good. A few days later, you see that your mom signed for the package and you can track that entire process. Well, how did UPS get there? UPS spent a billion, they do spend about a billion dollars a year on technology developing those systems, which sounds great. Let's just port over these logistics and payment systems. The problem is they don't work. And they don't work for a few reasons. Connectivity is an issue. You can't assume connectivity. So those little brown devices aren't going to work all the time. Um, identification, 
you can't assume that someone's going to pull out their license and show you who they are, um, or that there's going to be some form of reliable ID. Um, and because you wind up working in places with weaker legal systems, you get your agent workforce tends to be less reliable. You can't really sue um, your worker. It just becomes a lot harder. So now we have a whole new set of technology problems. And the reality is that we're not investing in, in solving them. We are in MasterCard, and lots of folks are starting to get involved. But it is a different technology problem. And it is a problem that, if you get wrong, can have dramatic consequences. I was just with someone that put in place a payment system. Great. And they forgot to lock the database, uh, which, if you code, is a pretty basic thing that you, don't, that you do. You lock the database. Well, what happened is the transactions got overwritten so that the balance did not equal um, the sum of the transactions. And it's like problems like this still exist in wide scale. And those are the problems that we need to solve. And we need to solve them at scale not just for the humanitarian cash programs, not just for the development cash programs, but for the systems that will actually change a lot of these people's lives. Um, and I think everyone kind of plays a role. I think as we see the policy shift from OFDA and others, um, KYC regulations changing. Um, this is what's going to get actors to act. Because kind of speaking from GiveDirectly's perspective, we've taken a very aggressive stance on metrics and improving operations. But the reality is that a lot of that does not get rewarded in the contracting procedures. We're not at a place where everybody can measure efficiency, be subject to KYC. Um, once we get there, agencies will follow. And I think we'll see a pretty dramatic shift. Great. Thank you all. So uh, we've had um, there are a lot of strands to pick up on. But um, in preparation for this conversation, I think uh, one of the things we consider were uh, where do we want to jump off from? So will we make the assumption that um, in some contexts uh, cash is better than commodities? And then from there, that in some of those contexts, um, it is possible to build uh, sort of a digital railway uh, to make this process more efficient. And I think we've heard a lot um, of ifs and, and perhaps. And so I think it would be great if you all can highlight some examples of contexts where, OK, this uh, cash is better than a commodity, and then um, this uh, the system of cash delivery is already robust enough that we can conceptualize uh, building sort of a stronger um, pathway for other types of aid or uh, financial inclusion off of that, um, whether it's actual or uh, sort of hypothetical. Do you want to hear some of that? I'm happy to start. I was actually just in Zimbabwe uh, about two weeks ago. Um, working with the USAID mission there. Uh, our mission to Zimbabwe is what we call a humanitarian assistance plus mission. So we really um, don't do much in long-term development investments because of the relationship with the government there. So it's primarily um, food assistance. And much of that food assistance under the Food for Peace program has recently uh, switched to uh, cash assistance. And Zimbabwe is a great market where there is a very aggressive mobile money provider. There are actually three, but there's one that's quite dominant, led by the, the dominant telco. It's called um, Echo Cash. And what you're seeing now is almost, after two or three years, you're seeing almost saturation of the urban markets. And so what has become the sort of commercial game for the uh, digital payments, digital financial service providers is, OK, how do we, how do we get the, the rest of the 60 70% of the country where we know it's, it's harder to figure out where to start building out our agent infrastructure? Uh, people are typically poor, so our revenue is going to be less, so we need greater volumes. It's just a little bit trickier of a commercial case for them to make. And then you have USAID, who is explicitly needing to get cash out to these same rural population sets. And so a partnership um, really enabled uh, USAID's implementing partners who were already out in the community and had defined targets and defined criteria of who the assistance was to go to, were able to work with the commercial service providers to help set up that infrastructure and thus use the payment rails to both deliver the aid um, I would say much more efficiently, certainly more transparently. There were more 
upfront cost, but getting to the point of preparedness and that the recurrent costs, <coughs> even starting in year two, are already coming way, way down. There's, there's going to be clear cost savings within, within a one-year cycle. And you see the service providers really um, now chasing after and investing in this business kind of in a bespoke fashion for us because now they're seeing the opportunity to capture the remittance recipient market from because many people get uh, in these rural areas get remittances from South Africa, Botswana, nearby countries. And so you get this sort of beautiful synergistic relationship whereby we are not only you know, more efficiently, more effectively delivering assistance to the rural poor population sets that we care about, but we're also um, bringing them into a formal financial system, probably for the first time ever, which, you know, as soon as that happens, they have a whole range of other products that become available to them, and they're linked in a much more direct way to their family members and social networks. And you have uh, helped catalyze the commercial model for, for making this poor, more difficult to reach um, group of people actually viable customers. So that's just one of many. I've got mm -hmm. a bunch of this. <laughs> Do you have any more? Um, I would say, so we've had a few, yeah, we've got a, a few different examples um, where we've gone from um, cash transfers and cash payments in that have transitioned either out of existing agriculture programs or have transitioned back into uh, ongoing recovery programs. Um, and we've seen that in a number of different contexts. I think the key thing for us, though, is not assuming that that's an easy transition to make. And the, 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 uh, the difference between a, um, using, um, using digital payments for a transfer purpose and then thinking about what that same individual needs when they're thinking about a livelihood purpose, so whether they're thinking about making payments when they're thinking about savings and the different kinds of savings products that they might need that there is some um, that there is some work that needs to go into the actual redesign process there um, and I feel like that's where that's again that's one of these kind of key points where um, if we're not attentive to where that connection may be made and that sort of fluidity between um, the transfer product versus the the savings product or payment product um, that's where I think we can, um, sometimes these can fall down. But, um, but we've seen great examples in, um, certainly in East Africa, a number of examples there, as well as in uh, South Asia and Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. So um, in terms of sort of silos or who gets included uh, when a system like this sort of makes that transition, um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. We mentioned, for example, presenting an ID or know your customer. Um, I would imagine that as a system becomes um, more sort of robust um, and part of kind of an Im economic inclusion or financial inclusion railway, um, the, the barrier to access increases. And so going from sort of uh, what you need to show to qualify, right, for humanitarian aid and then sort of how we can build up, there's quite a distance, um, particularly for those who are typically excluded, so women, uh, youth, um, the more vulnerable. And so how are you all thinking through addressing that gap? I mean, it's a funny one, or not funny, haha, -ha, but the issue is that on, from a humanitarian <coughs> perspective, and that's what I come from, like, that's the first question. The question for me isn't sort of what happens later, it's how do you make sure everyone is in? How do you make sure that the most vulnerable people benefit? And all of that will influence the systems that you determine, that you decide to use. It'll certainly influence the level of ID that you ask. I find it very curious that, um, that giving people money, we've been giving, transferring resources and humanitarian aid for years, and we are applying a severe double standard once it moves into cash. It can be, it can be the same value. You can give someone three times the value in food aid and you do a thumbprint. You know? Now, I'm not saying that that's always the case, but the second that cash came in as the resource being transferred, it upped the bar in terms of several things. Now, I think that we should be raising the bar on a lot of it, not in terms of ex exclusivity, but in terms of standards. So it's not so much that we should say, oh, we should apply 
our usual standards that we've been using for in-kind assistance to cash, but actually we should use some of these standards that we're applying to cash in terms of accountability, in terms of looking at the efficiency issues, in terms of making sure that people have access to the system, to all the, the aid that we use. So my primary concern is around ensuring not so much that that um, you know an, uh, that a more open system you know that we apply better standards later but actually making sure that um, that we're making sure that the priority the, the focus in the first place is on access to the systems because from a humanitarian perspective that's going to be the first and the greatest and the most important and when you're you know when you're looking at systems that humanitarians are using then then that's going to be the challenge how can we um, deal with some of these trade-offs and some of these competing priorities um, that, that are inevitable essentially when it comes to that. Mike. No, and I think you can look at requirements for ID as a burden, and I think using a national ID would be, and it would eliminate a lot of the most vulnerable people. Or you can s think about more broadly what identity is as a way of getting the people who deserve the benefits, the benefits, to prevent them from being coerced, um, to prevent money going to ghost households or households that don't actually exist but have somehow showed up on their enrollment database and goes to someone administering the program's family member. So if you think about identity in that way, I think we've gotten to a point where we're getting pretty good. Um, fingerprints aren't perfect, vain. Th there, there are lots of ways that you can define identity. Mm -hmm. And I think thinking about identity as a way to make sure people get what they're supposed to get as opposed to a bureaucratic hurdle is the right way to think about identity. Sure. Well, um, I, I suppose I would agree that uh, there are many different ways to define identity, but I think once we get to sort of the bank level uh, financial inclusion, there are really a very narrow set of ways to define identity. So um, how, how are you all tackling that? I think we're so, oh, sorry. I was <laughs> say we're so far from that. I think we're at a point where we're giving out physical pieces of paper um, with, in many cases, no identity. So I think the gap to bank level identity is a long one. So I think there's a lot of steps we can take before that. Mm -hmm. But you're Sorry, right, Kate. Scarlett, that I think when you step out of the humanitarian assistance space a little bit more into the development world, this issue comes up quite a bit. Um, and ID has traditionally been one of <coughs> the greatest barriers to access for the poor to the formal financial system. Uh, I, I do think that the momentum globally is, is going in the right direction that as we see, um, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, the Better Than Cash Alliance, the G20 commitments to expanding financial inclusion, FATF recognizing financial exclusion as a risk, you know, it, just as much as AML and terrorist finance. Um, you're starting to see as new regulatory regimes um, are rethought, recrafted, they're emerging with really pretty creative approaches that balance, uh, take a really proportional balanced um, risk assessment of creating maybe tiered accounts mm -hmm. so that if you're not able to show any form of ID whatsoever, um, you are able to come into the, the systems, but your, uh, the amounts you're able to store, the amounts you're able to transact are capped. And then as you're able to become more fully uh, mm -hmm. compliant with KYC, these, these limits start to lift. That's not universal yet, um, but I think it's a great trend that certainly as new um, as new regulations and new policies come out that's becoming the new gold standard and I do think that the development community in particular and humanitarians um, actors especially can really place a, a really critical sort of connective tissue role in terms of making sure because one thing that often NGOs have in the field is they know the customers, right? And these might not be customers that have access to a national ID card or the gold standard, but they know generally who they are. And they're able to, I think, work with, um, with financial service providers um, and you know, find ways to, to meet the compliance mechanisms. We're seeing that quite a bit, where NGOs are really the ones that are actually helping overcome that hurdle for IDs, especially among more ven vulnerable populations. Yeah, I would add, I, I think that's a good point. And I think, um, I think if you look at f um, financial inclusion programs that focus on, for instance, youth populations or um, particularly vulnerable um, groups of women or, uh, uh, or d disabled groups where, where identity issues um, 
uh, as well as physical issues, may be a, a larger constraint to accessing these services. That the, there are negotiations that take place, but the the problem is how, or the challenge is how do we get the negotiations to elevate from one INGO speaking to one financial institution yeah. into something that's going to be much larger scale and that's that's um, a tool for the for development actors and the financial actors to 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 use together. Right. So you mentioned obstacles, um, and in Michael, you mentioned uh, sort of we're really at the level where we're giving paper to people still, um, and you know even just conceptualizing how we can digitize that and make it auditable um, is a challenge. So immediately I think of sort of cost, and I, I hear what you're saying, that there's an immense cost, uh, or, you know, funds lost um, in the transfer right now because these systems are not auditable. But to get a system there, how do you sort of convince um, a community, particularly the humanitarian community, which is, you know, sort of its immediate response <laughs> in some cases. Uh, there isn't a lot of lead time. Um, I think this example in Zimbabwe is slightly different, but I mean, if you're thinking sort of uh, Haiti or you know, uh, Im immediately after a catastrophe. It may just be that that context is not a good one, right, to apply this. But how do you sort of get around the cost um, obstacle and then the sort of scalability obstacles? Can I answer this? Y you can. <laughs> <laughs> just I feel really strongly about this. One. So, so, um, so I think, um, so I think we need to stop talking about um, there's only so much we can do because it's humanitarian and it needs to be fast and we only care about short term because the reality is is that of the countries where humanitarian action is taking place, the majority of these are recurrent crises. The majority of these are protracted crises. When we're looking at those places where it is those sudden onset natural disasters, those are the minority every year. Those are not the major majority. Um, and they are increasing, th but again, given that they are increasing and we are seeing greater occurrence in them, the opportunity for preparedness, for pre-positioning is only greater. Um, so I think there is a lot that can be done so that we are holding ourselves to that bar and being less reactive and more prepared. Um, I think there's also a lot that can be done um, in terms of the the bar that we are holding for ourselves. Um, I don't think, I think it's interesting, you know, we've had uh, interesting conversations about this when we've talked about, you know, what does success look like in humanitarian action? And often it's just doing it. It's just getting it done, right? It's just, did we get stuff delivered? Did we, did we, you know, we said that we would deliver cash. Did we deliver the right amount of cash to the right number of people? Questions of how we did it in terms of how long did it take to get cash to people? How much did it cost you to do that? How much ended up in their pockets rather than in the admin expenses of your operation? Those questions aren't asked. How much time did the, did the beneficiaries who were on the receiving end of that assistance spend coming to get their cash and what cost did it incur for them? Those questions are just never raised. Um, and I do think, you know, we, we do have, IRC's got a very strong commitment to building evidence. And I think that's the, the, the we, we want to push that out further into the humanitarian sector to say that, um, you know, it shouldn't just be left to the development field to build evidence and use those benchmarks, but really the humanitarian sector should also be holding itself to those similar bars. Can I come in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, as someone who works on evidence and humanitarian <laughs> evidence. Um, so basically, I think the gap in evidence uh, that people often raise is what you want versus what you have, and that's different than what you need and what you have. Um, because cash-based assistance, other than malnutrition, has been the most researched and evaluated mm -hmm. tool in humanitarian response ever. It's keeping me in a job, and I appreciate <laughs> that. But I really <laughs> honestly thought that after contributing or writing the good practice review on cash transfer programming, I was like, great, well, we put that together, <laughs> like, done and dusted. Because what we know from a couple hundred evaluations, at least 10 studies <laughs> using randomized <laughs> methodologies, is that it works. Um, when it comes to women, we know, well, it depends. When it comes to corru corruption, we know actually no more or less risky. When it comes to nutrition, we know it definitely depends. Um, and when it comes to whether you can do it, the answer is yes. What we know is that you need to basically be thinking through these things in advance, that you need to have the right systems, and that you need to basically address the fundamental challenge that 
aid agencies have been doing something else for a very long time and that they can we have to basically have some really strong incentives negative and positive for delivering the most appropriate form of aid because we owe that to people um, so when it comes to evidence I'd, I'd say there's actually um, you know a fair amount of you know a large amount of evidence I think um, I think you know WFP spent and and if pre here did these you know very extremely high caliber studies um, for randomized control trials on cash transfers looked at impacts looked at costs looked at cost effectiveness and they cost 10 million euros and I honestly think that was actually worth it because they needed that caliber of evidence to be able to move forward at a strategic level however we can't just keep saying well we need more evidence on it what we need to be working on is why aren't we acting on what we know to be true what we know to be true is most humanitarian aid is protracted and recurrent why do we have annual funding cycles that basically work against doing this kind of longer term investments that we're talking about. It's not that we don't know where disasters are going to happen for the most part and that they're going to be happening for a long time. So this again gets into the, 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 the politics of it all um, and I think those are the very tricky questions that we need to be working through and navigating because there are so many potential advantages when it comes to doing the right thing um, and giving people assistance that could actually, even when you do it poorly, they will use it for what they need it most, um, which is, I think, extremely positive. Uh, so we have to be tackling these because otherwise, when it comes from the humanitarian side, we're going to keep hitting the wall that we know what to do, we know what systems, we know where we should invest, and we have these great ideas, but why isn't it moving forward? So I think tackling and, and navigating and being strategic is, is what we've got to focus on. Great. So I think Michael had a question. Oh, I was just going to add something to Rod. I completely agree with everything that Sarah just said. But to your original question on, well, doesn't it cost more? What's the problem with scale? I think we forget that literally, just to come back, printing things and shipping them. And we can go to the Kenyan example where literally paper gets shipped up and back between the fields seven times is really expensive. And the best benchmark I have for this is if you think about what happened in the US, we also used to have food stamps that were printed coupons. And then folks like Xerox and JP Morgan, and there was a campaign to digitize uh, the U.S. government cut spending on that program. I think it was about 50%. It was dramatic as we went from that old system to the new system. So yes, the new systems cost money, but so did the old ones, and they cost a heck of a lot more in many cases. And then in terms of scale and speed, I don't think you can even compare. I think as you think about humanitarian now, you can put the digital system in place where when something happens, you can press a button and pay those people that have already been enrolled in the platform, that's not possible with physical networks and physical logistic systems. So I just think, yes, it costs something, and yes, it takes some time, but it's dramatically better than what we have today. Can I just pick up on this theme um, of preparedness a little bit? Because this is where I think as well, we run a risk when we start to think about humanitarian assistance and agriculture assistance and education assistance and health assistance where as a, as a broader humanitarian development community, we're not very well poised, whether it's through funding cycles or in our case, specific <laughs> earmarks from Congress and the way our indicators are set up. We are, it's so hard for us to make investments in long-term you know, cross-cutting <laughs> infrastructure. And so even now when we hear about the humanitarian assistance space talking about preparedness and pre-positioning things, and, and talking about linking that to cash transfers done electric, electronically, it's, it's still a full step away from thinking, okay, how can we work to build these systems up and have them in place so that they're there and they're part of the lasting economic infrastructure of countries before a disaster strike, right? And so obviously Ebola is something that's consuming um, probably about half of the building that I work in right now. And we're seeing this play out exactly there, where as the you know, initial crisis, especially in Liberia, is starting um, to, to look like there's a little bit of a, some good news on the horizon, we're thinking a lot now about economic recovery. And the absence of these basic payments rails, both to have been able to continued payments um, to Ebola responders, 
But now, to be able to effectively implement social protection policies and support communities that have been devastated by this epidemic, I mean, the opportunity cost is huge. And, you know, watching, and we're part of this right now, watching the development community come together and try to manage 50 different organizations now working in Liberia, all of which want to import their own voucher system. And we'll say, wait, 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 you know, <laughs> we're going to try to coordinate all of this. And that's, fortunately, the UN has this job, not us. Um, but making sure that, uh, that all of these very significant investments are actually something that's going to last and provide a platform for resilient, broad-based economic growth and the opportunity to implement effective social protection policies, I think is really critical. And it's hard to do that in the midst of a crisis. And so to Radha's point about all of us collectively thinking more about preparedness, you know, I, I think that's really um, you know, just an absolute critical priority for us as a, as a policy community. Great. So one more question for me, and then I'll open it up for everyone else. Um, so uh, in terms of sort of opening this up uh, policy-wise and, and sort of what the reticence is to do, what many agree is sort of the right thing to do in certain contexts, um, wouldn't this really involve a uh, sort of getting in bed with a lot of the financial uh, firms? So, for example, you mentioned J.P. Morgan. and. Um, how would that be regulated um, at, at sort of a, a scale um, in terms of um, what their cut is, right, of, of delivering these, uh, this assistance? Um, and then two, wouldn't this really uh, involve putting a good number of aid workers out of work? <laughs> Who, which, I mean, maybe we can all agree could be a good thing. You want to take that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So on the, <laughs> you don't want to put us well, a lot of work. JP Morgan is not interested in the <laughs> in the Liberian <laughs> yeah. population. Um, no, I mean I think that there is um, I think that there is um, so I think there's a big opportunity there, and I think that for um, financial institutions, um, telecom companies, um, the private sector as a whole that has a role to play in this. Um, I think one of the one of the problems that we have at the moment, and it's this idea of you know you go Lebanon, you know anyone who's in this room who's worked in Lebanon in the last couple of years would see that there's you know there's an extraordinary number of NGOs working there, and they are immensely coordinated. I mean the 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 level of effort that goes into um, coordination activities in that one country is really phenomenal, um, and it's. And it remains unbelievably fragmented. Operations remain incredibly fragmented, and there is, um, and that involves um, that's it's fragmented in terms of the approaches that are used in um, in actually delivering cash, but also in terms of the engagements with financial institutions, with um, the government of Lebanon. And so while um, so so I think we need to as we're actually engaging the private sector in this conversation, it's. It's important for us as the NGO community to come together and not have you know the the premium be on coordination, but I think really be concrete about what our asks are and what is required and what we're expecting them to deliver on, um, and then be open to really thinking about you know there is going to be a cost and there is going to be a, a need for incentivizing adaptations in business models. Existing development business models are not effective for humanitarian action. They don't allow for, they don't have the adap adaptability or the flexibility that rapid humanitarian response requires. So what is it, what are the incentives or um, what are the incentives that we can put in place to make that a uh, compelling business case for the private sector to take on? And for us to be comfortable with the idea that some of that comes at a cost, but that might be an immediate, a short-term cost rather than a long-term, uh, a long-term sustained one. Um, and in terms of putting aid workers out of business, I mean, that's okay with me. <laughs> if <laughs> um, I'm not against it by any means, but um, the challenge is, is not so much that everyone's trying to keep their jobs, but who is it, if you really thought, 
okay, we've got this tool, we've got this system, we've got a disaster, we need to reach large numbers of people. Who has the capacity to reach large numbers of people? Donors don't really coordinate. They don't come together. So you're already talking about a division a bit in funding streams. <coughs> now you might be able to bring them together slightly on this front. Um, it, it could be possible there. So now you're thinking, okay, we can bring a few donors at least together around unconditional transfers, you know, maybe use some common pooled funding system. But who has the capacity to target um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people? Um, because that's where a lot of the effort comes in. It do doesn't matter if everyone has a card. You've got to know who needs to be in on that system unless you've essentially figured all of this out in advance and you know who's exactly affected. And that becomes tricky with the monitoring as well. So governments can do this. Government of Pakistan, who delivered you know huge large number of social um, of um, of cash transfers as as a disaster response. Uh, WFP worked through the government of Philippines uh, to reach a lot of people after Haiyan. It excluded people who weren't already a part of the social protection system. Then you've got a model where you could actually well, you could bring NGOs together around it, so you could have a consortia approach. We saw that in Somalia, not digital mm -hmm. payment system, but it happened. Um, or you can work through large UN agencies who then subcontract NGOs who then work with local partners, which is essentially part of the model that we have now, adding in a bit of the bilateral um, you know, uh, models with NGOs. So I think it's that we have to tackle these questions, not just about the financial system, I think, would be the easy part. The problem is that you know, getting, you know, knowing who you're reaching and, and also being able to monitor what happened with it. Uh, it's, it's the targeting, I think, is going to keep aid workers employed. Um, but let's go ahead and try to find some solutions around that. Great, thank you. So uh, my colleague Patricia has a mic. Um, if any of you all have questions for our panel, I'd be happy to take them now. Here's one up here. Do you want to raise your hand again? She's, thank you. <coughs> First of all, it's great to see the progress that's being made. Um, in Haiti, we tried to implement some of this. It just wasn't feasible, partly because the bankers in Haiti wanted to have such extraordinary fees on top of it. Um, and we're now doing Ebola-related work instead of cholera work. Um, and we're looking at building resilience capacity zones. So we're doing assessments in these capacity zones and then trying to get resources to the communities themselves. One piece of it that I haven't heard much about is how do you design the system so it actually builds the value chain within the communities that it's serving? Um, because if it pulls too much fees out or creates dependencies on large systems, it actually may weaken the sustainability and, and resilience of the communities. So I'd be happy to take this. This is something we're thinking about right now and exactly in the context of, of the Ebola crisis. And I really think that the power actually, that, that the, the donors have to be much more involved in having these aggregated conversations rather than having NGOs and implementing partners try to negotiate with service providers by themselves. Um, we've tried this in a couple of markets so far and have been you know, pretty pleased with the, with the results of what happens when you come in as USAID or DFID or Gates Foundation and say, you know, I'm bringing all of my partners in this particular place to the table and we would like, you, know, you start to negotiate what bulk rates would look like, service level agreements, um, access uh, if, you know, if, if necessary to USSD codes those sorts of things and um, because you have a real mismatch I think now between the NGO development community operating on the ground and the financial service providers and especially the new entrants into the financial service um, market the you know mostly the telephone companies who aren't used to working with each other and the new products aren't you know, aren't very flexible. They're often very expensive because of the business models that the providers are trying to make, you know, their revenue off of transactions. And so this is again where I think donors, some sort of institutional level of brokerage um, can, be, can be very helpful. Just to add to that, <coughs> I think it needs to be commercially viable for those folks longer term. I won't mention this specific example, but I was literally in a country that just put out to bid one of these big cash programs. And one bank won. Um, a few, two of the other banks pulled their proposal. So we talked to them, why did you pull? Well, we ran the math and there's just, we're going to lose a lot of money on this. So we went to the winner and said, well, why, 
well, how did you guys think about the economics? How did you make it work? And they hadn't, was the short answer. Um, they just said, oh, this seems good. We're going to do it. Uh, that's really frightening. Because what will likely happen, and we've seen this other places, is that they will roll out this network and very quickly realize they're losing money. Mm -hmm. And then stop it, stop investing in it. And then you're going to have this cash program, which is a massive cash program midstream with this broken system that the provider is not investing in. That's part of the problem. Any others? Yeah. Will you take both of them? Um, I, I suppose what, one of the interesting things, I mean, really interesting discussion is, you know, when you, when you talked about the, the results of, of this assessment here and 10% um, of, uh, <coughs> of the cash was actually spent on the purpose for which it was given. And I suppose what strikes me very much is the siloed nature of developmental and humanitarian organisations. You know, we're an organisation for health or we're an organisation for agriculture. I mean, there's a... It's more a comment than a question, but I think a huge amount of work to be done between the donors and the partners around if you're giving cash for health, but I as a parent decide that there's a greater need within the family, how is the uh, impact going to be viewed at the end? How is, yeah. What's the evaluation going to look at? Was it a successful program? Was it not successful? And on what basis, you know? And I think that we're not even close, maybe, to, to getting to those issues at the moment. Yeah. Um, but I also think that, you know, taking this a step further and saying that it's okay for families to decide how they best want to use it would actually remove a huge number of barriers that exist at the moment between partners yeah. and, would, and would allow us to go to scale at a much better, quicker level. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Michael, and I'm from Include. Uh, mine is uh, more like a comment, uh, and I think it's critical for us to uh, to discuss further on collaborative uh, partnerships between humanitarian efforts and also uh, digital financial services. The um, reason why I say that is uh, because of uh, the opportunities that can, up, I mean, because of the challenges that both collaborations can solve. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, we're currently involved uh, in an initiative uh, in the Ebola-affected countries uh, where there's a humanitarian effort to disburse uh, uh, cash to victims and also to health workers. And of course, these countries have limited infrastructures, you know, even to uh, disburse funds digitally. But one of the things that we found out is that when we we called, you know, uh, for you know operators' uh, opinions on this, they were really very interested, even to increase their investment in infrastructure to disburse these uh, funds uh, electronically. Uh, I mean, we saw operators who are saying, you know what, we'll roll out ten thousand POS in the next two weeks to get this sorted out. So, and it's it's very important for us to be aware that G2P initiatives or humanitarian uh, uh, efforts could actually be key to lifting some of the barriers with uh, the optic of DFX, especially in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So for example, <coughs> the issues with uh, financial awareness and education, which is a very, very strong uh, barrier to the optic of DFS, can be broken down when you have Collaboration, uh, collaborations between, uh, you know, humanitarian efforts and you know DFS partners as well. So I think it's it's very critical for us to continue to discuss this, to see how, you know, <coughs> I know some of the uh, some of the humanitarians uh, how they have strong affinity for cash. I mean, the the result of what you just read out to us probably will want to you know, incite you more to be focused more cash disbursement, but there's a need to start looking at uh, give a, you know, a distributing this thing through DFS. Mm -hmm. yeah. So any comments back to those two comments? So I can respond, and I should have said actually a critical <coughs> part of that evaluation as well, because the, the 90,000 disbursements that were made were made through digital payments. 
Um, so just in case, and so I, I tend to use cash somewhat synonymously with digital payments, and because in the vast majority of our work, that's what we're that's what we are doing. Um, so your point of um, you know the, the focus on digital finance is is well taken. Um, I, I think that in in that partnership piece on the humanitarian and financial and digital finance sort of sector. Um, one of the things that's very, I, I agree that there's an opportunity there, um, but I think again, it's this, it's this notion of where is the business case, right? So if we're thinking about um, certain markets that we're working in, um, whether it's in Niger or looking at, and, and, I, and within that I'm saying in very localized areas, I'm not talking about at a national level, I'm talking about high risk areas or in certain parts of DRC, you know, um, not network coverage isn't uh, isn't the same, isn't uniform throughout. Um, people's pe local populations' comfort levels with digital finance tools, mobile tools, is not uniform across the board. Um, likewise with merchants when it's a voucher program. So I think what we where we do have while we do have that opportunity, someone has to bear the cost of actually doing working on the uptake issues and the adoption issues. Um, and that is something that can be folded into the humanitarian piece, but I think we just need to be very clear on the, on the cost associated with that. And whether it's the humanitarian NGO that's bearing that or the, or the financial institution or MNO, MNO um, that, that needs to be considered somewhere. Um, on the, the piece around the Lebanon work and the, the silos, I fully agree. I mean, I think what we want to see and where where we want to get to is that we stop being quite so technocratic around the use of cash and start being a little more um, trustful of both the evidence and what people are telling us. We have sufficient evidence now in certain areas that people are on the whole using cash for the things that we would want to, it to be used for um, as uh, when we're looking at it in, in, in total. Um, similarly, we're, we're hearing loud and clear that this is what people would prefer. So now it's really up to our, um, our own institutions, and really we need to go far up the food chain. It's not just our institutions, but we really need to be able to um, exploit those two, those two pieces of um, messaging that we're getting and, and, and really raise them so that we can change both the way that our planning processes take place um, and also the mandates of, of our organizations and how we're expected to, to um, act on those. So. Yeah, I would just add one quick thing. It's not a, it's, I think there's some encouraging numbers out there. There is a recent project in Bihar um, which actually put the choice to recipients. So they had food coupons, so a dollar food coupon. And we actually offered them the opportunity to sell that coupon for 50 cents of cash or 75 cents of cash. So less than the food voucher actually cost. And you saw, depending on the actual amount, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of people selling it. That's a very compelling, it becomes a very compelling case to the government, which it has in Bihar, because they can save money, because it costs a lot less fiscally to 50 cents than a dollar, um, and they can pick up votes. And I think that's, it's numbers like that and more projects like that, which will help spread cash. So just um, sort of devil's advocate, um, the other side of sort of the silo and giving, um, the silo and receiving, can you think of some examples where, you know, and I know we've sort of moved beyond the cash and commodity debate, um, but vaccination, uh, health interventions, where perhaps we may want to be uh, slightly paternalistic in terms of what, what we want the aid to be spent on um, in certain contexts. I mean, we've seen, for example, with the Ebola response, um, contexts where uh, maybe the decisions that are being made by people are not sort of the best right right off the bat um, until the risk is understood um, mosquito safe mosquito nets uh, those kinds of things um, yes well, that's interesting because this is it's fundamentally a subjective and a philosophical question and what I decide on that might be different than what someone else decides on that I mean I personally think give people as much flexibility as possible because you do not understand the trade-offs that they're making in these settings that might not become apparent for years. Now, however, if your starting point is shelter in the Philippines, you need to assist with shelter reconstruction. That's not necessarily one where you don't want to 
you know, engage in a very close format. So there's just different options. You can either um, do conditional transfers, whereby you verify that people are constructing along a certain way. Uh, you can give vouchers for certain products. So it's certainly possible, but I think we have to recognize that a lot of this is fundamentally a subjective question on how much you think that people should have the ultimate flexibility to sort out their own needs. Mm -hmm. And that is going to, and the answer from a lot of aid agencies is some, some nervousness. Because what we say around, you know, trusting people and giving, we have log frames, you know, think about USAID and their log frame. And we're supposed to say, you know, the outcome indicator and the impact. And once it doesn't become food consumption score or number of shelters, once you look at, you know, how do you, you look at most significant change? I mean, can you just put that in the box? I think you should. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't work very well when we talk about the realities of the bureaucratic system. Um, so that's, well, that's my two cents. Yeah. Namely Congress, who Congress. were, who yeah. were, <laughs> were speak yeah. to. But I, I would actually argue that it's not just a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a technological question as well. I mean, I, I think it's important to realize that we're in the very early days right now of digital financial services that are made explicitly to work um, among the poor. And right now, the systems are pretty clunky, frankly. The user interfaces are pretty bad. Um, most of the businesses, I think there are a handful, we have several of us in this room probably can, can agree on who those are, that have really invested in, in a business model, as Michael mentioned, that's, that's going to be good for their business, um, but that's also customer friendly and meets a lot of the financial literacy or financial capability questions um, that Michael from Insure mentioned. But, but I think we're starting to see, you know, some products whereby you can have hybrids, right? And you're actually responding still to the needs of, of beneficiaries or clients. Um, one of M-Pesa's products, the m product that lets people um, lock away savings for a specific purpose, you know, to save up for school fees, has been incredibly popular. And there are ways now to keep some money liquid, give people some choice, and also be a little bit more directive if that actually serves a policy goal. So I think that we, sh you know, we shouldn't be too limited by sort of where we are today and what's available. What we should be thinking about collectively is how do we continue to make the case that this is a, a huge um, you know, opportunity cost, a huge opportunity for businesses. I mean, you still have you know, two and a half billion um, people in this planet that are unserved. And it's not that they're not making financial transactions or, or making use of financial options. They're just typically pretty bad. And so how do we really work together to create that narrative that this is, you know, this is not only um, a development imperative for those of us working in this space, but for the private sector partners, help them see uh, the opportunity to serve this new emerging customer base. Okay, well, thank you all very much for attending. Um, and we look forward to the next stage of this conversation. Great.